is Michael Vitrano along with my co-host, Michael Torriero. Today's guest is the pride of Longwood, the pride of Suffolk County, the pride of New York State, the pride of the United States of America. She's poised to make the next Olympic team. That's Jenna Burkett. How are you, Jenna? I'm awesome. How are you? Good, good. So um, we're talking a little bit off air. The, the la- I, I can remember the last two times I saw you. You were probably, uh, you know, 10 or 12 years old at a, at the, a Longwood tournament. And then um, I remember in out in Fargo, uh, Mike Torriero and I were coaching Team New York, and I believe that the senior women's team was practicing. So I, I think that uh, we got to watch you there. But obviously, there's a long journey along the way from there. And I kind of just to start out, tell it, walk us through from that time, you know, as a in, in the Longwood or youth wrestling program, and how you got through, you know, through high school, through into you know the junior circuit, the senior circuit, the W cap, and kind of where you're at now. Just to kind of give us a once over of your, your your story. For sure, yeah. And so I started when I was six years old, uh, originally from Rocky Point, New York. Um, and I my saw hometown, players. by the way, he gets he, he talks about Rocky Point and go Eagles as much as he can. So that's probably one of 10 times that he'll bring that up today. I know hey, it's I mean, a history of Rocky Point and Longwood. So okay, I, we yeah. rep both. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I started there, and uh, you know, there's just a flyer in school. And my older brother is autistic, so I kind of just grew up. Uh, we didn't play board games, and I was always just rough, rough housing with my older brother. Uh, so it was kind of a natural feel. So I grabbed the flyer and I was, you know, I was pumped about it. And this kid in my class ripped it out of my hand and was like, whoa, Jenna, like, you can't do that because you're a girl. And so I had to rip the flyer back and was like, oh, yeah, well, watch me. And <laughs> I, uh, I went home and begged my parents and they were like, you know, no, no, no. Like my mom's like, Jenna, you realize you're going to be the only girl. And I was like, yeah, well, what's your point? And, you know, she was just speechless. And I, you know, I started and I think they thought I was going to kind of quit, but I just kind of had a knack for it. I enjoyed the room. It wasn't like an intense uh, little kid wrestling room that I kind of see more often now. Uh, You know, we played more games than we did anything else, but it taught me the fundamentals. And, you know, it was was Darren Goldstein there and they drilled it into my head about women's wrestling and it's the real deal. It's going to, because it wasn't in the Olympics at the time. Right, right. Uh, but they told me it would be, and they said, you know, just to keep on, uh, you know, following up with it. And uh, it was Darren who actually got me the opportunity when I was about 12 years old to go to the camp in Staten Island. And that was where the Olympic girls were training right before they went to Athens. Wow. And, I, you know, my eyes were wide. I remember I went in there. I didn't say, you know, you're talking about the girl who was an actress. She had no problem talking to any Mets players at those games that I would go right. to. But I walked into that room <laughs> and I, my mouth was zipped. Um, <laughs> My mom had to keep nudging me towards the girls. And, and finally, I think, you know, Marcy Van Dusen just started picking me up. And, and I started wrestling with those guys. And, you know, I was hooked. I knew I knew early on that that's, that's just what I wanted to do. Well, that's I got to interject for a minute because um, <laughs> I was in high school when you were, you know, just starting out in that Rocky Point room. And I don't know that you remember me as much as I remember you. Um, but you were the most beautiful little girl and you had, you know, the human eye doesn't grow. I think it's always the same size and you had the biggest blue eyes and the thickest hair. And I remember you got in a stance and it looked so natural. I remember just thinking like, holy crow, this is, that's right. That looks everything about what she's doing is right. And we would drill you through it. You were so serious about executing drills and being in that room. You were so focused. Um, yeah, it was, it, it's etched in my memory. If I ever write a memoir, it'll be, you know, one part will be about, you know, uh, just when a little girl fell in love with wrestling. Um, because, yeah. you know, that's what, that's what I think about when I, when I remember you as a, a youth wrestler. You know, I, yeah. I wanted to just say again, first of all, I hope you realize you, that I, I, you really are the pride of Suffolk County in New York. I mean, you know, people follow you. We know about you and, and we're definitely 100 percent behind you. Um, you know, just to talk about some of the sentiments Michael said, who was, you know, you, you walk through how you, you know, Coach Goldstein, he's inspired so many, you know, both men and women, boys and girls. So who, who was you, if you can come to mind, who's the first person you idolized in the sport? Who did you kind of look up to most? Do you remember who that would be? I remember really um, looking up to Kerry McCoy because obviously he was, you know, he went to Longwood. So yep. by the time, and I was always around Longwood wrestlers, even when I was at Rocky Point. Um, and so I kind of knew those guys and they always talked about Kerry McCoy. I mean, he was a star in Long Island, but I, you know, <laughs> Jesse Jensen, all those guys, I remember, you know, I grew up with, with those guys and when their sister wrestled and, and it was just all these hammers, but I, I really looked up to Kerry McCoy uh, and then on the women's side, it was Patricia Miranda. And, you know, those, I remember my first, uh, one of my first camps that I did, 
uh, in Long Island, you know, carry again was drilling into me of that you know I need to stick with it that I could really be something one day and you know it's one thing when your mom tells you something because you know my mom will tell me that I'm the star at everything I do of course of course uh, <laughs> but it's one thing to hear another thing to hear it from an Olympian someone who's done it at the world and senior level so you know that really opened my eyes that wow I, I could actually be something well I'm, I'm so totally... as far as go, go ahead yeah so as far as competition is concerned um, when was you know the first time that you had competed that you had realized that, you know, the world was a little bit flat. You could take this outside of just your hometown and the island of Long and that you were able to kind of, you know, go beyond what, you know, your even your wildest expectations, you know, early on were because you probably had none. Yeah, I mean, and we didn't do too much freestyle. I was introduced to it here and there. I did a few tournaments and I remember liking it more than folk style. It just fit my style a little bit better. Um, but then... It was body bar. So that was like the cadet and junior trials at the top time. They called it body bar. It's yep. it used to be sponsored by. And I went there. And then from there, I got the opportunity to compete at the cadet Pan Am trip. And that was in El Salvador. And so I was a freshman in high school. And I went there and I won that. And the coaches was telling me about the United States Olympic Education Center and, you know, some, something I could do someday. Um, so that was really when, you know, I was my first international competition and then I won it. And I just, <laughs> wow. I, I, <laughs> that's a pretty good confidence boost right there. Right. Yeah. So, Definitely. so the, the next thing that we want to be able to do is talk about, you know, there's another young girl from, you know, the North shore of Long Island or, you know, in the middle of Kansas, um, or, or anywhere in the world right right now that that has follows you and, and wants to hear about taking the same trajectory and the same route um, that you took. So I guess the next thing that we want to find out is, can you talk a little bit about your transition from, you know, that college program into the military, um, what the WCAP program is about? And I think that Mike had some questions specifically on the WCAP program and kind of what the lifestyle is. But, you know, really try to paint the picture for somebody that doesn't know um, you know, how they'd go about following what you did and all the benefits to it. For sure. I mean, the biggest thing is to getting that freestyle exposure. The international styles are really important. I think a lot of men and women, they focus so much on folk style uh, and it can end up hindering them later on. So I think for me, that was a big thing I did early on, had the freestyle. You know, I think I competed at freestyle when I was nine years old at upstate New York. So I did that a lot. Um, and then I went to all the age level stuff. You know, I went to Fargo, I went to junior, you know, trials and things like that. And, you know, Fargo was everything that kind of put me on the map. You know, I went from placing fourth at certain tournaments to I, I won Fargo and that was it. That's where opportunities started to get thrown at me. Um, but, you know, you got to remember that was, I didn't always win things, you know, that I, I had to work my way up. So Fargo is important, it, important, but it's not the end all be all. So I would definitely say getting that freestyle exposure, going to these camps that have freestyle clinicians. Um, and, you know, I, I did my time at the USOAC in Northern Michigan. And then from there, I moved out to Colorado Springs. Uh, and then I was a resident at the training center. And then, you know, I heard about the Army WCAP program, didn't know too much about it. Uh, and then the more I started hanging around some of the athletes that were part of the program, you know, you started to learn the ins and outs and, you know, what it's like, you know, because at the time I didn't know, I didn't know if I would have to like, go to war right away or things like that <laughs> <For sure. laughs> it's like scary stuff you know you go to um, war in a different way now just on you know on, on a circle right yeah definitely yeah no that. and that's 100 percent. like that's a part of my job to be in the world-class athlete program is to bring world and olympic medals home you know that's that's my purpose right now it doesn't mean that when i'm done wrestling i won't um you know continue to serve uh right now we we do it simultaneously like i'm still up on all my uh, online trainings. I still go to my military schools. Uh, so I remain competitive on the army side as well on the wrestling side. Uh, so that's, you know, very important so that I have this plan for when I'm done wrestling to kind of go that route. Um, you know, a typical, typical day for me, like outside of kind of the COVID stuff is we always have our uh, formations where we meet with our, our first sergeant, our commander and everybody part of WCAP that lives out here. And they'll give the briefings for the day or the week, let you know about things that are coming up. And um, then after that, we'll do some like maintenance around the facility and clean up or whatnot. And, uh, and then we'll go to our wrestling practice. And then after that, you know, you'll get whatever else you need. Uh, sports med wise and then you you stay up to date like if you've got to do your online trainings you'll do that if you've got to 
kind of do like your medical stuff just to basically so you're always green in the army is important you know make sure you're updated on everything uh and then from there just kind of go back home recover eat and then get ready for my second workout uh and that's that's pretty much typical typical day for army w cap very exciting. Now, do you have an MOS? I mean, is your MOS uh, uh, to be an uh, obviously a world class athlete, or do you have a specific MOS? An MOS is like a, a you know duty or responsibility for those that don't know, right? Absolutely, yeah. So I'm a '92 Yankee, so I'm a unit supply specialist. So I'm uh, I basically am in charge of all the equipment and things like that in the army. So. Yeah, it's um, it's pr it's pretty good gig. After sometime after Tokyo, I'll, I plan to go to my next military school, which will be ALC, so I can get promoted to staff sergeant. Because right now I'm, I'm a sergeant. Fantastic. Yeah. So if I if I understand it correctly, just for again for people that are listening at home, um, they want to join, they want to go ahead and be Jenna um, a, as they get older. Are they just going and joining the military, or do they have to speak to some people prior to that? And then once they get in the military, are they then getting a job? and then applying to the WCAP program? Or do you go into the military and you go right into the WCAP program? So everyone's kind of got a different story. For me, I kind of met the credentials for WCAP uh, by making a world team and things like that. So I kind of joined with the intention of joining WCAP, right? So I, I mm -hmm. talked to the coaches, I swore in, got shipped out after Olympic trials in 16, uh, and then became a soldier and then came back and then I was put on army WCAP orders. Now there are some people like my coach, for example, he's a, a staff sergeant, Jermaine Hodge, and he joined the army. He wrestled in college, joined the army, and then right away got sent to Korea. And he was like, man, oh my God, I keep <laughs> born to go to Korea. Like, <laughs> can't they just, my whole life's going down the drain. And um, while he was stationed in Korea, they were uh, letting the, the soldiers know that there was a wrestling tournament going around in Korea. And it was kind of a thing just to keep the soldiers out of trouble, basically. So my coach signed up for it and then he won the first tournament. And then he just kind of went along and was winning all these competitions. And that's when um, some commander told him and, and let him know about the Army WCAP program. And he put us, you, you'll put a packet in and then it'll get approved on your unit side and then it'll get approved on WCAP side. And he sure enough came here for all army camp. Uh, and then he just kept getting better and better. And uh, the coach told him, Hey, if you can place top seven at nationals, we'll, we'll put you on orders. Uh, and so that, that's kind of, that's his story, you know? So if I were to tell a, you know, a young female, I guess, depending on the age, if, if they came out of um, college, you'd kind of hope that they're almost reaching that um, the level where their credentials meet W cap, you know, if they made yeah. a junior world team, a U 23 world team, senior team, things like that. They're top three in the country. Uh, they can pretty much come right into W cap. Now for an athlete that's kind of on the, on the border of it, there's um you can, you can still enlist and you can put in your packet for all army. Like let's say you joined and you were national guard, you put your packet in for all army and then they'll ship you out to Fort Carson during the January and February timeframe. And you'll get to compete with us. You'll train with us. And depending on what the coaches think, if they think you have potential, they'll keep you around a little bit longer. Uh, so it gives you some time to work, work your way up in the program. But I've, okay, I've so seen you, play. Okay. So you mentioned that you went to, to learn how to be a soldier. Uh, you know, my older brother is a, is a war hero. He served in three branches of the military, two tours in Iraq as a sniper. He's got a lot of perspective that he brings home for Christmas dinner. And right. when you say that you went to be a, be a soldier, are you meaning that you went to boot camp? And if so, um, what's more difficult, boot camp or an intense wrestling practice? Um, yeah, so it was boot camp. You know, I, I would say boot camp definitely brought its, its challenges and you know I knew I was ready for it because I was a wrestler so I felt like yeah this would never break me like I've cut weight I've done all these hard things so of course you know I will always say that you know wrestling is one of the, the hardest things you'll ever do but I will say that there were aspects to boot camp that I didn't expect to be as challenging you know like if I'm doing the right things I expect for things to go a certain way but if somebody down the line isn't I guess what I'm trying to say is I wasn't used to like mass punishment. You know, I was, I was kind of thrown off and, and then the more we got in, we got in trouble, the less sleep we got. Um, so those came with, with its own, own challenges and um, doing those rough marches and things like that. It was a, it was a different type of challenge, but uh, it motivated me for when I came back, you know, in fact, right when I got back from basic training, I had, I think four weeks under my belt of wrestling and I went and won a national title. 
So it, it just kind of like sharpened me in a different way. Like Heck. I wasn't in wrestling shape, but at that point in time, I just felt like there's like, there's nothing I, I couldn't do, you know, six minute on the mat versus some of my, you know, the fellow soldiers are out deployed. So I just, it gave me that perspective that there's so much more than wrestling. There's a lot harder things, you know, people are, you know, not with their families during the holidays. So it just kind of gave me that, that edge where I felt like, you know, six minutes would never break me. Wrestling, a sport measured by technique, mental toughness, discipline, and persistence. But it also brings children with all skill levels interested in the sport in droves when there's great coaching. Team Purcelli Training Center in Iowa is at the epicenter of great wrestling. Being one of the best youth clubs in the Midwest, the center has a deep understanding for community and wellness. At the top of their game, they may be in Iowa, but they have nationwide appeal and a national model for success. Run by U.S. Veterans National Champion Anthony Purcelli, Purcelli's vision and mission of the center is to build children from the ground up with their wellness in mind. To Priscelli, it doesn't matter if the children are novice wrestlers or state champions. His goal is to build character, create a positive nurturing and spirited environment, and to produce respectful ambassadors in his community. The training center benefits people from all ages, ranging from the average fitness workout to mixed martial arts, specialized youth training, and self-defense. Purcelli Training Center, where excellence is the standard. Now, just do you have are you able to have contact, you know, with your family? Are you able to, you know, I mean, you're in the army. You're also in the world class program. How does that work? I mean, are you, um, you know, especially during COVID or during, you know, do you, are you able to have like unlimited contact with their protocols? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, I'm very lucky. My, my family moved out here back in 2017. So they live just 10 minutes down the road, uh, which I'm thankful for because if they were still in New York, there's no way I would have been able to see them this entire time. It's been very strict protocol. It's, it's a big reason. It's the main reason why I haven't competed in a long time because uh, just because other people are getting on these cards, you know, I, I was offered a lot of matches, but of course, yeah. I couldn't accept them due to like army restrictions and, you know, the hot zone for COVID. So um, it's been a really difficult time getting competitions and getting things approved, but I'm really hopeful for the captain's cup next month. And in fact, I'll be a captain. So I'll be able to pick my team. So very excited for that opportunity. Um, and then again, like you're saying in the question, my parents are high risk. So I spent the first three weeks um, completely isolated from them, made sure I didn't see them. Um, and then I finally started to slowly go over there and uh, my parents are a little bit older and high risk. So we try to take care of them as much as possible, but yeah, it's been tough, especially because some people around us have, have gotten COVID. So I've had to, you know, really like be diligent and make sure I'm doing the right things. Uh, and, you know, knock on wood, it's, it's been paying off, but it, you know, it's a crazy, crazy time. And, you know, I, my brother's autistic and, uh, you know, just trying to keep him engaged and things like that, you know, so my family is obviously the most important thing to me. So just making sure that they're all good. <laughs> So for, for sake of video, let's go with, uh, I want to talk about, um, you know, what you're doing for autism awareness. I mean, it's, you know, something that I think hits everybody in, in their family and their friends in some capacity. Um, you know, so uh, I have, you know, family and friends, the whole thing. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, we're going to have other questions towards wrestling, but can you talk a little bit about the autism awareness? I mean, it's really fantastic that you're, you know, have such a great heart and you're in such a combative sport, right? I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, you know, I just, I just try to spread awareness as much as possible. I, you know, I remember back when my brother was younger, it was extremely hard for my parents. You know, they couldn't get anyone to babysit my brother. Uh, it was, you know, they talk about a date night. They never had one because they had a brother. <laughs> that. So, you know, it, it was really tough on them. And I think a, a big part of the problem is just like, people are really just unaware of things, you know, like how difficult their life is. So I try to just shed some light on, all disabilities, but obviously autism is something that was, you know, it's been, it's been a part of my life. I remember when people thought autism was like something you could catch if it was like a disease. Um, oh, and I, yeah. you know, I see the way people would look at my brother and it was one thing when my brother was really little and cute. And so the noises he made was, it was cute. So people just let it go. And, you know, now my brother's uh, 32, you know, he's, I think he's 32. He's a, you know, he's an adult. People, 
it, it's hard for people to understand, you know, and my brother is a gentle giant. And if, if a baby's crying, like he literally tries to see where they're at to like kind of help them. Uh, but to a stranger, obviously that's a, a no go. So um, just kind of, you know, shedding, shedding light on the, the struggles and you know what it's like kind of living in their shoes and I, I can't imagine living in a world where I couldn't express myself you know that's you know it breaks my heart and I'm you know my mom's never heard my brother uh say mom or that you know he loves her and obviously we know that he does but uh you know it's been a long road but it's definitely worthwhile I, I credit my parents to being super you know disciplined with my brother early on and you know a lot of the kids that he grew up with they're all in group homes now because they get a little bit too strong and they don't know how to control their emotions um but my brother fortunately is you know he's really gentle he's got his moments but usually i can kind of snap him out of it we were we're very close so. I, I i could say this he's he's clearly fortunate to have you as a sister i mean you're clearly a good person and and I, I thank, you know, for you, for your bring awareness and also, you know, thank you for um, your service. Um, to, just to get back to wrestling, you competed 57 kilograms, right? Yep. Yeah. And, and, I, and you talked about the captain's cup. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that, you know, your, your training, preparing and tell us about that tournament. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. It'll be the first time I've competed in about a year. So it'll be a great opportunity. It's uh, the six athletes that are um, the captains will be uh, Sarah Hildebrand at 50 kilos, uh, Jakara Winchester at 53, myself at 57, uh, Tamara Mensa Stock at 68, and then uh, Victoria Francis in for Adeline at 70. That's some lineup right there. That's some lineup. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. A bad, <laughs> it's a bad, bad crew right there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Definitely. And so, so what's we'll what's, what's the format? What's the, the you know the format of, of the event? Where can people so, see it? Yeah, the on Flow Wrestling. Thanks to Titan Mercury and Flow and USC Wrestling for uh, putting it together. Uh, the draft will be this Saturday, January twenty third. Uh, not exactly sure how that's going to go. I know I'll be the last pick on the first round and the first pick on the on the second round. Uh, so it's about you know filling my lineup in those six weight classes. Um, and it'll just be some good competition. I think what I'm most excited about is that, um, you know, I'm hoping just to let loose, you know, it, we haven't wrestled in so long. Like I'm just, I'm hungry to compete. I'm hungry to test my skills. Uh, and I know the other females are, are just as passionate, uh, and there's some money on the line. So the first place team gets, uh, each athlete will get three grand and the second place team will get two grand. And then the third fantastic. place team. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and so and let when, me ask, is, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Mike. I was just going to say, um, when, 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 what's the exact, just so we can tell the, what's the exact date on that? I know it's going to be on flow. What's the, you know, the top timeline on that. So it'll be February 13th and 14th will be the competition. Okay. Okay. Mike, mm -hmm. I think you. So, yeah. So one last thing, um, you know, that just I'm curious about personally is with all this time that we've had away from COVID, um, you know, without having an end date to compete um, without these type of things, what has been the mentality when you've gotten into the room? Have you just slowed up the focus of your wrestling and focus on positions or, you know, making sure that you can be ambidextrous on both sides of the body and hit, you're hitting your attacks? Um, you know, what's the mentality and focus that you, you know, not that anyone's going to be able to follow this later, but what's the last year been like getting into the room and, and sort of where you've been technically and mentally? You know, I think initially when we were completely off the mat, uh, it was just about staying sharp, you know, being thankful that, you know, I'm alive, like focusing on the things that I can focus on. You know, I can't sit and daydream about when will trials be, when will this be, you know, because it'll just like eat up at you. So I just had to really have this grateful mindset for every um, for every day. And, you know, at the beginning of it, I was trying, we were hiking, I think, 40 miles a week. So I was wow. just trying to challenge myself in odd ways you know like 40 miles a week I was doing my workouts so that kept my focus for the first few months and then we started getting into our cross training and you know just just being my best every single day that's pretty much what I focus on all the time you know COVID or whatever you know uh just just being my absolute best I, I find that when I'm you know, I got to be where my feet are. I don't like to think too far ahead. And I think that's really helped me. I think when we first started coming back to wrestling, I was just trying to get my timing right. It was really important to just slowly feel things out. Um, mm. And then after that, it was transitioning into getting back in shape. And then after that, it was these two practices a day, like how mentally tough can it be? Um, and I think in times where I used to be, you know, I'd get a lead in, in matches or in practice and I'd kind of sit on my lead, like, 
now I'm just, I'm hungry, man. I just want to score as much as possible. <laughs> I love it. I love, but, you know, you, you mentioned what, what's, I want to talk more about what's, what's practice like, you know, for those people listening at, at, at the senior level of WCAP program, are you, you know, drilling specific positions or there's a, a lot of live wrestling, you know, how, how much technique kind of walk us through a typical practice. I mean, I'm assuming they're segmented into different ways. Yeah, I mean, I would say at WCAP, we pride ourselves on our conditioning. You know, of we course, really right. want to be yep. in the best shape possible. I would say, like, our mornings are a little bit more technique-based, a little bit slowed down. But then by the end of that technique practice, we're doing some live wrestling. Um, sometimes it's situational. Sometimes it's minute goes, three-minute goes. And then we'll build to our, you know, our six-minute matches. Um, but I would say, you know, in the mornings, we a little bit slower. And then by the afternoon, you know, we we get our drill in and we get get right into some live wrestling. Um, we, we change it up from minute goes to three minute goes a lot. Switch partners, um, a lot of, you know, 30 second goes. You have to score. You're on the shot clock. Um, and we'll do that so many times that by the time I think it, it's probably over, there's, you know, five more to go. So. <laughs> that's do you, do you guys? I would want to do you guys practice specifically though the new push out rules and the new out of bounds rules? Do you guys practice that specific situation a lot? Is that is that something you guys go over? We try to, you know, every time there's a competition, we kind of see how the refs are calling things. Uh, you know, our, our sport is so subjective, evolving, which, right? Yeah, yeah, and it, and it makes it hard, especially for the the your average fan but you know i watched at flow wrestling they were calling when you're on your knees and you slide out they were calling that to be a point but then just over in france they were getting the same position that's a grand prix right yeah yeah no point so it's kind of frustrating as an athlete because that's a big difference you know when, when you're on your knees and you slide out um so definitely like you like to get clarity as much as possible um, and then at the end of the day, you know, I, I just choose to make sure I don't leave it in the ref's hand. You know, I, I've been in that position before, you know, it was, it was nationals uh, in 19 where, um, you know, I got a gut wrench and got reversed and, you know, she ended up getting two points when it's really only one point. And then the same match, mm -hmm. I did a reversal and they give me one and not two. So, uh, at the end of the day, you know, everyone's human, we're going to make mistakes. So I just, you know, what are you going to do? It's life. You got to keep moving on. <laughs> sure for sure so um you know i just know that um you know there's few people walking around with with your resume with your experience you know it, it, it's quite remarkable um you know if you were to not be wrestling and you were able to be a bird fly far far away you know what would be an alternative universe life that um you and your wife would be living you and your family would be living um so on and so forth if there was one um that's a, that's a fun question. You know, I, I, I am still wondering why I never became famous on Vine because I was like, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I it's had not too late. I mean, you're still young. It's not too late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I felt like I had the potential to be an, like, you know, a YouTuber. So in a, in a crazy world, I would definitely love to be an actress. You know, I, I love entertaining people. I always have. Um, but, you know, outside of wrestling, you know, I've just, I'm passionate about motivating people as I've gotten older, you know, it's, it's way less about me. Like I want my team to be great. I want everyone in army WCAP to succeed. You know, I, I feel myself to be like, you know, a soldier for life. I, you know, if I wasn't wrestling, I would like to lead in a, in a different capacity. I, I find, you know, more so it just, that's what really what fills my cup up. I love to just, you know, help mm. people as much as possible. I think that keeps me a lot more focused and, you know, it's, it's, Truly, it's cliche, but it's just, it's never about the wins and losses. I've had big wins in my career. I've had big losses, but the first time probably in my whole career, you know, this is the most fun I'm having. I, you know, I'm 27, but in my, I feel like I'm, you know, 21. Like I, I just genuinely really love what I'm doing. And like, you know, I feel like I'm still learning and that's the, every day I've just been, you know, I've since COVID just shifting my mindset and, you know, I feel so much better. Like I just, I'm like, I never want to take this for granted. I just want to score as much as possible. Um, so it's, it's crazy. You know, I feel like people think I'm on the older end of my career, but you know, I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm just getting started because it's just started. It's more fun now. You have, yeah, I love now, you. Go ahead, Mike. No, I was going to just sort of say, um, you know, not that we have a lot of following, but if people from Long Island did want to follow you and they did want to support you, you know, and again, we're going to be able to edit some, some things and turn them around. But if people wanted to support you from Long Island or around the country, 
where would they go ahead to get your contact information? Or is it Twitter? Like I contacted you, is it Instagram? You know, what's the best way that we can plug it up onto the screen for people to, um, to be able to reach you? Awesome. Yeah. So it's at the Joker JB underscore on Instagram and then at the Joker JB on Twitter. Um, pretty active on my social media. So, uh, you know, definitely get back to as many uh, people who reach out to me as possible. Well, that's great. I mean, we'd love to, you know, um, love to maybe have you back on, you know, a after the, to uh, the tournament at some point. I mean, you know, you know, obviously your schedule for me. Are there any anything else that you want to endorse? Anything that you want to talk about? Like we, Mike said, we could certainly edit. Is there anything else that you want to talk about or, or endorse or, or bring up or shout outs? Uh, I have some T-shirts and things like that with uh, Compound Sportswear. So I'll send you guys the link for that if anybody wants to rep some Jenna T-shirts. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But other than that, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm just grateful. I'm really happy that, you know, Long Island supports me so much. I, you know, that, uh, that that's where I'm at at heart. It was, it was good competing in New Jersey last year because it was like somewhere close to the East coast. And it was nice to have um, all that attitude in one, in one facility, you know, that felt good. Uh, so I'm always grateful for the support. Well, well the I, entire country supports you <laughs> quite frankly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, th again, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for your service. You know, thank you for everything. And I, I can't wait to watch you, in, in not only in the Captain's Cup, but, you know, in Tokyo. I mean, you really, you have, you know, all the Suffolk County behind you. You know, again, I said it before. I want to say it again. You should know that. That's awesome.